follow the clues. The Hunt. True Crime. 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. Dr. Dan voted yes. By a vote of 17 to 4, with one abstention, the FDA Advisory Committee recommends emergency authorization for the Pfizer and BioNTech vaccine, citing that the benefits outweigh the risks. Where the approval process now goes before the vaccine can make it into the arms of Americans. The U.S. now on the verge of launching one of the most extraordinary and ambitious public health efforts in American history, shipping the first of nearly 3 million doses to locations in all 50 states. Meanwhile, the U.K. is now in day three of its first wave of vaccinations. And tonight we speak with a U.S. citizen in the U.K. who was among the first in line. Is it funny for you to feel like you're like one of the first Americans in the world? Yes, it is. It's very strange indeed. This, this to me felt like it was the first step back to towards normality. Also tonight, an exclusive look at how you might be able to sign up for a vaccine using an app. America's deadliest day since the Civil War. More than 3,000 lives lost in 24 hours, more than those killed on 9-11, as some hospitals have to potentially turn away patients. An ICU doctor in California working 20-hour days for weeks, what he's now seeing inside his own unit. President Trump hosts more packed holiday parties at the White House while he lasers in on his latest election challenge, hoping to get the Supreme Court involved. Tonight, more than half of House Republicans in endorsed the president's petition to have the justices nullify the election results. The latest on the fatal shooting of Casey Goodson, his family speaking out today as the deputy who shot Goodson makes his first public comment since the deadly encounter. Our conversation with Bill Gates. What gives you the most hope right now? The way we get out of this disaster sets a model for innovation and cooperation. How he says the world must come together in order to end this pandemic. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. The vaccine verdict is in, and in the end, it came down to a question of if the benefits outweigh the risks, and the majority of the FDA advisory panel of experts voted yes. That was the final determination after a marathon remote hearing on whether to recommend emergency use authorization for the first coronavirus vaccine here in the U.S. Today's hearing comes one day after the country reported its deadliest day in this pandemic, at least 3,120. 24 Americans killed by the virus. That's more than were killed on 9-11. In the middle of this devastating surge, we're now one step closer to the first vaccine, but some key questions were raised in today's hearing, including about potential allergic reactions to the vaccine. And there's still a very long road before vaccines are widely available to all Americans. So what did the panel consider and what comes next? Tom Yamas leads us off. Tonight, in what may be the country's most important Zoom call, the moment America has been waiting for. Based on the totality of scientific evidence available, do the benefits of the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine outweigh its risks for use in individuals? The FDA advisory committee voting to recommend emergency use authorization for the first vaccine against the coronavirus. We do have a favorable vote, and that concludes this portion of the meeting. The Pfizer vaccine found to be 95% effective with no serious side effects. Evan Fine, a Pfizer trial volunteer, believes he got the vaccine, not the placebo. The reason? He had mild symptoms like fever and chills following that second injection. Today, urging the FDA to authorize its use. It is simply immoral and unethical to deny the vaccine to healthcare workers or first responders who want it. An EUA must be granted and it must be granted tonight. We spoke with Evan. Americans all across the country are living in fear of this horrific virus. You think you received the vaccine. Personally, what does that feel like? It feels wonderful. I don't live in fear. I have to take the basic precautions that everyone else does. I have to follow the rules, but I do not fear COVID-19 anymore. And I want all Americans to stop fearing COVID-19. And with this vaccination, I believe that's possible. An issue that came up time and time again, that news from the UK, 
Two healthcare workers who suffered allergic reactions after being injected. Both have a history of severe allergies. There are tens of millions of people in this country who carry EpiPens with them because they have peanut allergies, because they have egg allergies, who are going to believe now that they can't get this vaccine. That's a lot of people. The panel recommending more research has to be done, and the FDA says warnings should go out for people who might be allergic to the ingredients in the vaccine. The next step? FDA authorization. That could happen at any moment. We can act quickly and we uh, intend to. We understand the urgency of the situation. The moment Pfizer gets the green light, workers at its plant near Kalamazoo, Michigan, will start moving 2.9 million vaccine doses, removing them from 300 freezers, then loading trays into special thermal boxes packed with dry ice to keep the vaccine at 94 degrees below zero. Our Alex Perez is outside that massive plant. They have been planning this for months. Employees here at this massive facility will be working 24 seven until all of the doses in that first batch are loaded onto trucks and shipped out. U.S. Marshals will also be here to secure the operation. Teams will be tracking those boxes outfitted with GPS and temperature monitoring as they move across the country on trucks and planes from FedEx and UPS, heading to more than 600 sites. The two shipping giants splitting up the country to divide and conquer. The goal? To hit every corner of the U.S. within 48 hours. And hospitals facing a daunting challenge. Once they open the boxes, they have just 90 seconds to transfer it to special freezers. If something goes wrong it's not an easy replace other times we've had freeze, uh, freezers or refrigerators that don't work we can replace the drug in this case we can't for days now teams like this one at new york's mount sinai have been rehearsing how they will take those vials and carefully divide them into doses for injection we really want to treat this vaccine as the liquid gold Liquid gold indeed. Tom Yamas joins us now from FDA headquarters. A long day of questioning, Tom. So what stood out to you from today's hearing? And what are the next steps for the FDA to give that final authorization? Well, first, it was a long and very transparent meeting. Of course, the FDA and this advisory panel and Pfizer, they wanted Americans to see the process and to hear the research and hear the questions. This went longer than expected. The vote came down very late tonight, uh, at least later than they had on the agenda. The things that stood out was there was some real concern whether there was enough research into 16 and 17-year-olds. You remember, the emergency use authorization is for Americans that are 16 or older. Some felt there needed to be more research, but one member who voted in favor and we should point out the vast majority of the panel, 17 to 4, voted in favor, said the question is not when do we know everything, it's when do we know enough. And we should point out the FDA almost always takes a recommendation of their advisory panels. But this remains under review tonight. This remains under review, and we have some breaking news that just happened seconds ago, Lindsay. So the head of the FDA tweeting out saying that they fully uh, appreciated the transparency of the advisory panel and Pfizer answering those questions on that public live stream and saying right now it is still under review. But the authorization, Lindsay, could happen at any moment. Tom Yamas from FDA headquarters. Thanks so much, Tom. As we await what will be one of the biggest mass vaccination efforts ever here in the United States, we're getting a glimpse of just how challenging it will be. In the UK, the first nation to green light the Pfizer vaccine, people continue to stream in. James Longman got rare access to one site and has this report. The race is on tonight in Britain, the cutting edge Pfizer vaccine being rolled out across the country, a glimpse of the challenge facing America. So, vaccination centre, here we are. We got rare access to see it up close. The main thing about this vaccine is it's got to be kept very, very cold. This box may not look like much, but it's the all-important freezer where this vaccine is being stored. Once it's brought out of there, it's put immediately into a regular refrigerator and it thaws for three hours. But then the countdown begins. It's taken from the refrigerator to this team of pharmacists who assemble each dose. They have only two hours to administer it once it's put into a syringe. The nurses are needing them as quick as we can draw them up. The UK has made history this week, but it's also had one of the largest number of deaths from COVID in Europe. It's going to take time for this country to turn the tide on the pandemic. This hospital is doing 25 vaccines an hour. An estimated 6 million are first in line to get this vaccine. One of these doses goes to an intensive care doctor, Dr. Sancho Rodriguez-Villar. 
I think we have to deal by example, and this is one of the reasons I'm here. I really believe, you know, this is an historic moment and a good opportunity to change everything. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a good exit from this pandemic, the vaccine. 84-year-old Tony is next in line to get his shot. Okay, how are we doing, Tony? Are we ready? Whatever you say. Okay. With two recent allergic reactions reported, the nurse double checks with her patient. I know I've done all the checks already with you, um, but I just need to double check again. You've got no known allergies. No. No allergies to food or no. any drugs. No. Come in. There we go. Well, how about that? Well, well done. done. Something so simple, but really important, right? And done. Done, done. Yeah, finally. Next step to going home. Wonderful. It's been a momentous week for Britain and for science. The UK has been battered by this disease, but the vaccine is giving caregivers hope. How does it feel to be kind of part of this whole process? Um, I think it's, it's, it's exciting. It's a privilege to, to be in a position to be able to do, to do this. And for me, um, during the first wave, working in critical care and working in our makeshift critical care area and seeing the patients that I've seen and seeing how quickly patients deteriorate once they do have COVID-19, it's, it's exciting that we're in a position to hopefully try and prevent that. It's a big day. It's a big, it's a, it's a big day. David Fontaine Boyd is an American and the general manager at King's College Hospital. Like his colleagues, he's also received the vaccine. Is it funny for you to feel like you're, you're like one of the first Americans in the world? Yes, it is. It's very strange indeed. It's, um, I feel very lucky and I feel very, I hope that um, as we get more and more people, we will start to turn the corner. And we'll, this, this to me felt like it was the first step back towards normality. A first step indeed. For Tony, it means he'll be able to see his wife of 62 years after weeks of being apart. And he's missed her, his kids and his grandchildren. Hopefully we'll be able to see them at Christmas. Up until now, you know, Christmas was just a dream away. James Longman in London for ABC News Live. From a dream to perhaps a reality, our thanks to James for that. And we know that the numbers in this pandemic have been just so staggering that at times they can just be numbing, really. But mind you, there are lives behind these numbers, and tonight, a new one. The CDC's latest projection, 362,000 deaths in this country by January 2nd, and there are more than 106,000 COVID patients in hospitals tonight. Our Matt Gutman has more. Even when he sleeps, the swirl of death and disease stays with ICU doctor Tom Yadigar. She heard me screaming, um, flailing my leg, my arms, and I was disoriented, and I was clearly having a nightmare. Tonight, the country vaulting over another grim milestone, over 3,000 deaths a day. That's a reported fatality from the virus every 30 seconds. California breaking its own records in cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. For how many continuous days have you been pulling 20-hour days? How long is this going on? I can't even think, but it's probably about 12 to 14 days, somewhere in there. His hospital's parking garage, now a mashed unit of surge tents. In neighboring Arizona, only 10% of the state's ICU beds available. Anthony Fauci revealing his daughter's boyfriend lost his brother to COVID. So there you have a 32-year-old young man uh, otherwise healthy, actually, quite athletic and strong, who died. Uh, very sad. And across the country, frontline workers contracting the virus also. On Monday in Billings, Montana, we met Ellen Edland, whose doctors feared might not pull through. And tonight, able to speak for the first time in weeks with this message. Love my family. So happy for Ellen and her family there. Matt Gutman joins us now. And Matt, people there are convinced that, that that visit from Ellen's best friend is really what prompted her turnaround. Tell us more about that and what you've been hearing from medical staff about the difficult recovery for ICU patients like Ellen. You know, it's not the first time, Lindsay, that we've seen this. A loved one, a family member, a friend, visit someone who is in the ICU on a ventilator who seems like they're completely unconscious. They're under heavy sedation, fentanyl, and paralysis medication. Yet somehow, the visit, the handhold, the clutching, the whispering, the cooing seems to have some sort of palpable effect. It's not scientific fact, but certainly the nurses in Billings believe that that visit by Kelly, the friend of Ellen, really did 
did have some effect. Obviously, it's a long road ahead for people like Ellen in the ICU. Um, Ellen probably hasn't been on ECMO or the ventilator that long, but if you're in there for a couple of months, it means that you require uh, occupational therapy and you have to relearn how to do a lot of things. So long road ahead for many people, including Ellen. Lindsay. Sending her our best. All right, Mac Gutman, thanks so much. While the news of possible emergency authorization for the new COVID vaccines is widely viewed as a huge step in the right direction, there are still many hurdles from refrigeration to transportation and distribution to rural areas that state health care officials are currently trying to sort all out. Joining us now to discuss the distribution plans for his state is Alabama State Health Officer Dr. Scott Harris. Dr. Harris, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, curious to get a sense of in the last 14 days, certainly your state has has recorded more than 43,000 positive COVID cases. You have said that you expect, quote, dark days for the foreseeable future. Give us a lay of the land on the state of COVID in Alabama right now and also what your biggest challenges are still ahead. This is a very challenging time for us. Uh, Alabama is seeing the, the greatest number of, of hospitalizations than we have ever seen during this response. We're seeing uh, daily new cases in numbers higher than we've ever seen before. Uh, we, we have not seen deaths at quite the same rate that we had in the summer, but we're certainly uh, concerned about that given the, the recent uh, Thanksgiving holiday and the fact that our deaths seem to lag by two or three weeks after we have these big spreader events. So but we have a lot of concerns uh, going forward into December and into the rest of the holiday season. And let's talk specifically about distribution. The Pfizer vaccine, which is the first one that your state will receive, has intense refrigeration requirements. So what's the plan to get this vaccine to rural areas that may not have a nearby hospital or the refrigeration cap capabilities needed? Yes, we, we actually have uh, hospitals in our larger areas that have agreed with us to work on distribution in their own catchment areas. Uh, if we look at about a 40 mile radius around those hospitals that do have the capability to store the vaccine, uh, we can reach uh, around 80% uh, of, of our phase 1A population. That certainly uh, isn't everyone and, and that's certainly not sufficient. Um, for, for those parts of the of rural Alabama that don't have the ability to easily obtain that vaccine, uh, we're going to need to wait until at least the next week in order to have the Moderna product. That, that ship is much smaller, a lot of months, and, and of course doesn't have the same cold chain requirements. We, we wish we did not have to wait an extra week to reach some of those uh, areas, but logistically that, that's uh, the best solution we've been able to come up with. And of course staffing is a major issue in multiple states. Alabama is no exception. How are you filling in those gaps when it comes to who will be providing and injecting these vaccines? Yeah, so, so the hospitals have played a major role there, and then we, we will also be using county health departments. We will also be using other community-based providers, places like pharmacies, uh, doctor's offices. Now, the, those professionals, those frontline healthcare professionals are actually in the target population as well, and so we want to get them immunized as quickly as possible. But then they certainly will be the ones who are turning around and reaching out to those folks in their own community uh, to continue that vaccination process. Now, public trust is, of course, a big issue when it comes to vaccinations. Alabama, in particular, has the historical stain of the Tuskegee experiments. And for our viewers who may not be familiar, in the 1960s, it was uncovered that for decades, the U.S. government had been deceiving a group of 600 black men to believe that they were being treated for a disease known as bad blood, when in reality, they were actually being used as guinea pigs for a syphilis vaccine, which resulted in health complications for some and even death. As you may know, Dr. Harris, this has contributed to uh, a broken trust between some in the black community and the health care system. What kind of outreach has been done to educate black people in Alabama to reassure them about the safety of this vaccine? Sure. I, I would say, first of all, we, we absolutely acknowledge that the uh, historical mistrust that we see has been well earned in a lot of cases. I, I mean, to put it mildly, uh, we certainly understand and recognize why black Alabamians have concerns about the vaccine and, and really the whole partisan atmosphere we've been in for the last several months in this country, you know, have, have not made that that uh, any easier for everyone. Uh, we, we understand that in order for us to have credibility, we need trusted voices within the African-American community to be the messengers. And so we have, uh, for many months now, been working with uh, uh, faith organizations, uh, uh, black pastors organizations, 
with uh, African American uh, legislative leaders as well as local public officials uh, and, and many others who we have been trying to educate on the process and help them to come to having some level of confidence in the vaccine as we ourselves in public health have seen the evidence and come to have confidence as well. You know, ultimately we're gonna need uh, these local officials who have personal relationships with individual people in our state uh, to be the ones who are willing to uh, encourage people to do it. We know that their voices are trusted and heard uh, and respected in a way that, you know, a government entity may not be, particularly here in a state with the history that we have. And lastly, what's your biggest concern about the long-term impact of COVID on your state? And do you wish that measures like stay-at-home orders or mask mandate would have happened sooner? Yeah, I, I think we, we all understand that, that there are certain things that seem to reduce disease transmission, but politically it's been very uh, difficult uh, to, to get support for that and to get buy-in on, on that. Our, our state is really divided on that, just like many other places have been. I, I think that the long-term consequences um, really show some of the same fundamental problems that Alabama has had for, for a very long time, even pre-COVID. You know, we have a significant uh, disparity uh, in the number of deaths among black Alabamians compared uh, to, to everyone else, even though black Alabamians don't get infected uh, with uh, COVID any more often than, than we would statistically uh, expect them to. Um, COVID has really just revealed another health disparity that we've always had. We, we continue to have these differences in outcomes uh, with things like cardiovascular disease or infant mortality or cervical cancer, uh, many other things. Uh, and, and now we're just seeing it revealed again with COVID. But we still have areas with poverty. We have places where access to care continues to be a challenge. Uh, and, and unfortunately, COVID hasn't taught us any new lessons about that. It's just revealed the same ones we've recognized for a while. Dr. Harris, thank you so much for your time and coming on the show. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Today, President Trump made no mention of the deadly toll this pandemic is taking on the country. Instead, he focused on his latest attempt to overturn the election, with 18 states asking the Supreme Court to disqualify the results in four key battleground states. And 106 Republican members of the House are endorsing that move. Here's ABC's Mary Bruce. On the nation's deadliest day of the COVID crisis, President Trump hosted a packed holiday party inside at the White House, ignoring both the science of the virus and its deadly toll. The president is also ignoring the reality that he lost to Joe Biden by more than 7 million votes and is brazenly calling on the Supreme Court to overturn the election. If they have wisdom and if they have courage, we're going to win this election in a lot Republican attorneys general in 17 states are backing him up, joining the Texas AG in asking the Supreme Court to invalidate the results in four states Trump lost, Georgia, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. The brief they submitted riddled with factual inaccuracies and conspiracy theories. Trump is also pressuring members of Congress to sign on. Republican Congressman Mike Johnson telling his colleagues Trump will be taking names and is, quote, anxiously awaiting the final list to review. And tonight, Trump's troops are falling in line in an extraordinary move. 106 House Republicans are now supporting the suit and calling for the will of the people to be overturned. But Texas Senator Republican John Cornyn is not on board, saying he's, quote, struggling to understand the case. Mitt Romney summing it up in just one word. Madness. It's just simply madness. Mitt Romney, very clear about his frustration there. Mary Bruce joins us now. And Mary, how are the attorneys general in those four battleground states reacting to this suit? They are reacting with a blistering rebuke. Tonight, we are hearing from those states, and I want to read you some of the quotes from their legal responses here. The Pennsylvania Attorney General calling the case, quote, moot, meritless, and dangerous. He calls it a seditious abuse of the judicial process, adding that Texas does not seek to have the court interpret the Constitution so much as disregard it. And finally, calls this entire case legally indefensible and an affront to the principles of constitutional democracy. Harsh words tonight, Lindsay. Harsh words for sure. We're edging closer to the final electoral college vote. So what's the timeline for the Supreme Court to consider taking this up? 
Well, there is no set timeline here, but there certainly are a few options for how the court can proceed. They could just flat out reject the complaint even before considering it, or they could accept the complaint and respond with an opinion before actually hearing any arguments. Either way, we do expect them to respond quickly. We expect them to actually act before the final electoral college result, which of course happens on Monday. Mary Bruce from the nation's capital. Thanks so much, Mary. And when we come back, the deputy accused of gunning down a black man on the way home from the dentist for the first time gives his side of the story. The Chinese spy who allegedly targeted American politicians, including a former presidential hopeful. But up next, when the mass vaccinations begin, how will you be able to sign up? CBS gives us an exclusive look at what they plan to do. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change, well, like every day. So what is it that you really need to know, want to know, to help you not just get through your day, but make the most of it? Feel smarter, feel better, feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. It's all about you. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. This is going to be so good. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Burning. What you're seeing right now, this is part of the eye wall. This procession of migrants goes back two miles. There is going to be catastrophic damage. This fire has made a run. You can see those flames shooting up into the sky. We are on the jam-packed red carpet. Let's do it right, guys. So this is the fourth week end of protest. <laughs> Watch ABC News on location for Facebook Watch. Your mom said, comb your hair. Your dad told you, smart not. Your dog is judging you right now. And your best friend just called you crazy. We all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight. Now imagine getting your news like that. No bull, no spin, just give it to me straight. Straightforward news, straight to the heart of the story. ABC News, straightforward. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. So if you like getting behind the biggest news stories of the day, inside all the details, the backstory, and what will happen next, then listen to Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. It's like no other news podcast out there. Even the critics agree. Listen free on Apple Podcasts. Some applause there for firefighters in South Texas rescuing a four-year-old boy after he apparently fell nine feet down a water well that fortunately was empty at the time. The child was airlifted to a hospital and is in stable condition. Switching gears now, as soon as the final FDA emergency authorization for the Pfizer vaccine comes through, waiting in the wings, your neighborhood pharmacy. CVS and Walgreens are working with Pfizer and the U.S. military to get the first vaccines to health care workers and the most vulnerable. Bob Woodruff has the details. An historic vote today. A group of independent FDA advisors overwhelmingly recommended Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine, the quickest development of a vaccine ever. And that concludes the vote. So we do have a favorable vote. 17 of the 22 advisors so voting in favor. The meeting back and for those most at risk. It was Christmas Day to me. And I was so happy because I thought, this is my ticket out. This is my ticket back to normality. Now the decision goes to the FDA, which could issue a final emergency authorization within days. With those early limited doses likely to be reserved for health care professionals and nursing home residents, hospitals and long-term care facilities already gearing up. We expect to be able to go to every single facility that has selected us as a partner within three to four weeks to provide the first dose. 
Pharmacy giants, CVS and Walgreens, are standing by to help get the vaccine out to the people who need it most. So this is a list of the long-term care facilities that have actually selected CVS. People like Lynn Pixler, a resident of Symphony in Chesterton, Indiana. We'll be working with the CVS pharmacy, and they're going to come and do the vaccinations here at at Symphony. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And I, you know, I've one more chance to go on and bug my kids a little longer. And while the military is helping orchestrate the nation's largest mass vaccination campaign, civilian doctors, nurses, and pharmacists will be the ones to give the shots. It will still be your local pharmacist that is administering the vaccine. It is the person that you know across the street that you've trusted for your prescriptions that will be providing the service. The government says it has about 3 million Pfizer doses ready to ship as soon as the FDA grants authorization. And it's sending those precious doses administered first to health care workers and nursing home residents. As vaccine manufacturing scales up, vaccine will be made available to all seniors, all people at high risk, and eventually to all of us. It's a, it's a hope, not a fact, is that we'll be able to, to have access for you know, the broad population you know, sometime in the April, April or May timeframe of 2021. The biggest thing that I would ask all of our patients to do and all customers is we need to be patient. We know that there's only limited vaccine and it's going to be really important that those that are at highest risk get the vaccine. Though your turn is optimistically months away, both Walgreens and CVS will soon update their apps to determine your eligibility and eventually make an appointment. You know, there'll be a, an easy banner just like this one here, right? Get your COVID-19 vaccine, schedule now. CVS's Senior Vice President of Health, Chris Cox, gave ABC an exclusive look at what their app will look like. Our systems all talk to each other. So if someone is in New York for their first shot and Florida for their second shot, you know, they would be able to get both, you know, vaccines from us with the system completely tied together. And Pfizer won't be the only option. Soon, officials are hopeful we'll have FDA-authorized vaccines from Moderna, then AstraZeneca, and next, Johnson & Johnson, with even more vaccines still in the pipeline. Whether or not people are able to choose you know, which manufacturer they'll get is really going to be dependent on vaccine availability. Experts expect in the beginning days demand will outpace supply, largely due to the positive data posted by Pfizer and Moderna. And when I heard the, the, the two of them with the 90% and 95% efficacy, I was so impressed. So I, no, you couldn't, that, that, that day, I, I don't think I needed my wheelchair. I was floating. This is Bob Woodruff tracking the race for a vaccine. Many surprised about just how the, the number of the efficacy of those two vaccines are thanks to Bob Woodruff. Still ahead here on Prime, our conversation with Bill Gates, the billionaire using his vast resources to help fund the vaccination efforts worldwide, the challenges he sees ahead. The shark attack, one surfer says he never saw coming. And between vaccines and gifts, the immense strain facing major shippers, we take a look by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day, the soon-to-be second gentleman has just landed a new teaching gig. This is what being live is all about. Now, I can see. This is ABC News Live, the 24-7 streaming news source, ABC News. Wow. Breaking news, live events as they happen, streaming live, non-stop, straight to you. Original, on the edge, breakthrough storytelling from ABC News, National Geographic, ESPN, all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want, free. And imagine the most celebrated, epic live events and moments all playing out right before your eyes. See those flames behind me? And go deeper inside the groundbreaking exclusives from the campaign trail. Only ABC News gets. Watch ABC News Live right now and anytime. Streaming on Roku, Hulu, Facebook, and ABCNews.com. ABC News Live. Streaming everywhere right to you. ABC News Live. Here on the ground and the Iraqi 18,000 tons. Matatas. Ismail? Yes. David. David. 
over ground zero from Hurricane Michael. You can see just home after home. David, thanks for meeting us. This was your view. My favorite view. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. mornings may look different these days, but where you start your day, where you spend your mornings, where you get connected to everything that's happening. And face it, there's a whole lot happening in our world these days. Where you get all the breaking new information of the day to help you navigate through these times. That's why we're here. Good morning, sunshine. And making sure you start your day off with a smile and some sunshine. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Oh, how I love saying that. Wake me up. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier Podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. Welcome back, everybody. We now take a deeper look by the numbers at how vaccine doses will be transported across the country. Delivery giants UPS and FedEx were already in overdrive because of the holiday and the record-breaking surge of online shopping during the pandemic. And today, their executives told Congress they're ready for the, quote, mission of the century. This holiday season, an estimated 3 billion packages will be shipped, about 800 million more than last year, according to the New York Times, which found that by one accounting, 7.2 million more packages may need to be shipped each day this holiday season than the country's delivery systems can handle. FedEx says it's hired 70,000 seasonal workers for both COVID-19 vaccine deliveries and these holiday packages. And UPS says it's hired 100,000 seasonal workers for vaccines and the holiday surge. Now to keep the vaccine ultra cold, UPS is now producing 24,000 pounds a day of dry ice in its own production facility in Louisville, Kentucky. Kentucky. Pfizer's vaccine packaging stays ultra cold for 10 days and their goal is for every delivery to reach its point of use in 24 to 48 hours according to the company and 100% of Pfizer vaccine boxes will carry a tracker so the company can monitor their location and internal temperature at all times from factory to delivery site. Still lots to get to here on Prime. We have seen the plexiglass barriers throughout the pandemic but how effective are they in stopping the spread of COVID. It's an ABC News exclusive. The historic announcement, Israel and another Muslim majority nation seeking a path of peace. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace us! Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Burning. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. So if you like getting behind the biggest news stories of the day, inside all the details, the backstory, and what will happen next, then listen to Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. It's like no other news podcast out there. Even the critics agree. Listen free on Apple Podcasts.
Yes, mornings may look different these days, but where you start your day, where you spend your mornings, where you get connected to everything that's happening. And face it, there's a whole lot happening in our world these days. Where you get all the breaking new information of the day to help you navigate through these times. That's why we're here. Good morning, sunshine. And making sure you start your day off with a smile and some sunshine. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Oh, how I love saying that. Wake me up. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Friday nights, 9 8 Central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime. 2020. Friday nights, 9 8 Central on ABC. Based on the totality of scientific evidence available, due to the benefits of the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine outweigh its risks for use in individuals. The FDA panel voted 17 to 4 to authorize emergency use of the new Pfizer vaccine. The panel deciding that the benefits of this vaccine outweigh the risk for individuals who are 16 years and older. The panel debated whether that age should be raised to 18. It did not do that tonight. So now it's expected that the full FDA will accept this recommendation and the vaccine rollout could start within hours. The panel recommending more research has to be done and the FDA says warnings should go out for people who might be allergic to the ingredients in the vaccine. The next step, FDA authorization. That could happen at any moment. In the ongoing investigation into last week's police killing of Casey Goodson, Columbus police now confirm it was 17-year-old veteran of the force, Jason Mead, who fired those fatal shots. His family says 23-year-old Goodson was shot in the door of his home after returning from the dentist and a stop to pick up Subway sandwiches. Officer Mead's lawyer giving his side for the first time, saying, quote, at no time did Deputy Mead mistake a sandwich for a gun, claiming Goodson pointed a gun at the deputy and ignored commands to drop it. Goodson did have a license to carry a concealed weapon, but his family says they did not see a gun at the time of the shooting. In a news conference, Goodson's mother, Tamala Payne, says police still haven't explained what happened. Like, why? What did you do this for? What would make you do this to our baby? What he didn't do this to tell you? He was just a black man coming home from a dentist appointment. There were not any police body cams to capture those fatal moments. President Trump announced that Israel and Morocco have normalized relations. It makes Morocco the fourth nation in the Middle East and North African region to agree to establish full diplomatic relations with Israel. The United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and Sudan already established diplomatic ties with Israel. As part of the deal, the U.S. now recognizes Moroccan sovereignty over the entire Western Sahara territory. I hope it's just going to be the beginning of more uh, diplomatic achievements uh, between Israel and other Middle Eastern countries. Shark attacks reported in Hawaii and Oregon. A surfer dying from injuries after being attacked in Honolulu Bay. The shark also biting a huge chunk out of his board. And a surfer in Seaside, Oregon was hospitalized after being badly bitten on the leg by a great white. He says he never saw it coming. I can see you stay around, honey. She just released her record-breaking album, Folklore, but Taylor Swift has another surprise for fans. I'm so excited to announce that at midnight tonight Eastern, I'll be releasing my brand new album called Evermore. It is the sister album to Folklore, but it's all brand new songs. We basically just couldn't stop writing, and I am absolutely elated to be able to share it with you tonight. Swift set to drop 15 new songs featuring Haim, The National, and Bon Iver. Come midnight, Swift will also release the music video to her new song, Willow. Swifties benefiting from all that time the singer must have had in quarantine. Welcome back. Next to the investigation into a Chinese intelligence operation on U.S. soil allegedly targeting American male politicians, including a former presidential hopeful. Martha Raddatz has more. Her name? 
Christine Fung, and according to an Axios investigation, a suspected Chinese intelligence operative who targeted up-and-coming politicians from 2011 to 2015. It began years ago, it is alleged, through charm and campaign fundraising. Hoping to gain people's trust so that she could perhaps in the future help them change their mind on China policy and just generally give the Chinese government close insight. Axios reporting that Fong even wound up in romantic or sexual relationships with two Midwest mayors. So as they looked further into what she was doing, there were some major red flags and they put surveillance on her. And that's when they picked up some of her sexual activities and realized that she was getting close to some politicians. But the biggest fish she targeted, according to Axios, California Congressman Eric Swalwell, a Democrat on the House Intelligence Committee. Fong was a fundraiser in Swalwell's 2014 campaign and helped get an intern a spot on his staff. An FBI counterintelligence team was so alarmed by Fong's efforts, according to the report, they alerted Swalwell, who immediately cut off all ties and says he offered help to the FBI. He is not accused of any wrongdoing. It was around that time of that investigation that Axios reports Fong returned to China. Fong has not been charged with any crime. Our thanks to Martha for that. And turning back to our top story, now the race for the vaccine. For years, billionaire philanthropist Bill Gates has warned about the dangers of deadly viruses. Gates has poured billions of dollars into the COVID-19 fight, and tonight he hopes in the rush to vaccinate the world, some countries are not left behind. This will be seared in the memory of this generation, hopefully enough uh, to invest to be more ready next time, hopefully to invest more in all these infectious diseases that are, are, are still a huge problem. But it, it's almost at the level of a world war, I would say, and including the need to cooperate. Would you then say that this has been the biggest challenge of our lifetime? Yes. Since World War II, this is the biggest global challenge that we've all faced, even bigger than the financial crises that have come along. Billionaire Bill Gates hasn't just been outspoken about the pandemic. He's put his money where his mouth is. Just today, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation announced a new $250 million commitment, bringing their total investment to $1.75 billion to combat COVID-19. Given your money, your access, your ability to just kind of rest on your laurels, what made you feel so passionate about being a part of this? Well, our foundation uh, is passionate about saving lives and getting vaccines out. You know, the number of children who die every year has been cut from 10 million a year down to 5 million a year. It's, you know, I'm really pleased the companies have stepped up. Uh, the uh, plan is coming together to get this vaccine out. Uh, so, you know, it's a tragedy but there's a lot of heroes. The Microsoft co-founder and philanthropist had warned of a pandemic for years, even saying five years ago that the next epidemic could be a super contagious and deadly strain of the flu. If anything kills over 10 million people in the next few decades, it's most likely to be a highly infectious virus. Gates realized the magnitude of coronavirus before it was even identified as a pandemic. It was in February, actually Valentine's Day, when I had a dinner with the foundation experts, and I said, will this be contained to China? And they said, no way, uh, it's just not possible. Uh, there's too many cases, there's too much travel. And that's when I realized, oh my God, this is going to be unique in my lifetime uh, in terms of causing uh, global problems. So that became a top priority for the foundation to take this deep vaccine expertise we have and apply it to this disease. In 2015, you gave more than $50 million to SecureVac, which is really focused on this messenger RNA technology. How is that so different? And why did you see it back then, five years ago, that it, it could be so such a, a transformative uh, technology? These mRNA vaccines will be among the vaccines that help end the pandemic. We've been investing in them for quite some time because they will eventually be very cheap and you can have a factory that even once you want a, a, a new disease, 
you only have to change a tiny little bit of that factory to have it make a vaccine. You know, there are moments in time that really people might credit with changing the trajectory of mankind, of humankind, landing on the moon, perhaps. That's one small step for man. Where does this fall, this, this vaccination uh, for coronavirus, do you feel like this is kind of part of that timeline? Absolutely. I, I compare it to a world war where we had to change how we behave. We had to take huge economic pain uh, in order to avert the many millions of deaths that if we had just continued on uh, would have taken place. A large portion of his donations have gone toward vaccine development and distribution to help ensure the vaccine is delivered to all corners of the planet as quickly as possible. Well, there are many countries that have no vaccine factories at all, and it doesn't make any sense that their citizens wouldn't get any protection. After all, we want to end the disease everywhere so we're not constantly having these reinfections. And if anyone cares about equity, uh, they should not want the vaccines only to go to the rich people or the rich countries. And now we have these factories all over the world, including uh, Serum Institute in India, ready to help out. Uh, and so that the weight uh, for the developing countries isn't years. Let's talk about the impact. If let's say 70% of Americans do end up getting the vaccine, but you see a much smaller percentage in, in China or India or Africa, what would that mean ultimately? Well, we want to bring the amount of this virus in humans down to zero if possible, so that we're not constantly having to revaccinate or having uh, outbreaks in different areas. Uh, ideally, the whole globe would participate in this the same way that we work together to eradicate smallpox. You've recently talked about how we might have as many as six vaccines uh, by spring. Why is that so important, especially what AstraZeneca is working on? Because, you know, a lot has been discussed as far as like the specific temperature, for example, that Pfizer and even Moderna's uh, current vaccines require. Yeah, the Pfizer and Moderna are going to be a bit more expensive, harder to scale up, and uh, more demanding on this uh, temperature cold chain. The other vaccines uh, that are only a few months behind uh, will be cheaper, easier to scale up, and not as demanding. And I do think we'll have the global cooperation uh, to fund this vaccine for, for all of humanity. The U.S. Uh, is not yet shown up to that. An executive order signed by President Trump this week says that the U.S. will only share vaccine doses after there's enough for all Americans who choose to be vaccinated. At least as we get into the Biden administration, the fact that we care about other people, uh, I think that will reemerge as a, a priority because the U.S. has always been the leader in these health issues, HIV, malaria. The U.S. government and our foundation are always the two biggest funders of these infectious diseases. There are some people who are concerned about taking the vaccine. What would you say to them to kind of allay their, their fears? You know, medicines have to be uh, tested in trials, and there are sometimes rare, rare side effects. The net benefit of this, if you look at the data uh, from these high-quality re regulators, is very, very high. And so I hope people will be rational about that and listen, uh, you know, if you're in a multi-generational household, if you work at a school or a nursing home or a prison, you really owe it to the people there that you're not transmitting to them. And what are, you're kind of looking in your crystal ball, and I, I think you've kind of put 2022 as the deadline ultimately, or hopefully the, the time frame in which the whole world has kind of moved beyond coronavirus. Yeah, the progress uh, in the rich countries will be pretty dramatic even by summer of 2021. But for the entire world, it'll probably be out sometime in 2022 before we really get the coverage levels uh, that we need to drop the numbers to be either tiny or zero. Gates is now hopeful that other members of the Billionaire Club will step up to help. Uh, I always think we could do more. Uh, you know, we should give more, give smarter. And we have a group called the Giving Pledge that brings people together. You know, I hope in the future uh, people are even more generous. Even before we conquer COVID, 
Gates is already talking about combating the next global disease outbreak. You say next time we'll be able to do it a lot faster. What will be the difference next time? We'll have gigantic mRNA factories and we'll be able to do mRNA uh, at under $2 and no uh, cold chain requirement. In the midst of uh, all of the, the darkness and despair, what gives you the most hope right now? Just the way people have come together on this, you know, science, caring about other people. I'm very hopeful that the way we get out of this disaster sets a model for innovation and cooperation. Our thanks to Bill Gates for speaking with us. And on Monday, he and so many others who've been instrumental to helping us find a vaccine will be a part of our special edition of 2020 The Shot, the race for the vaccine airing at 10 p.m. Eastern on ABC. And next to plexiglass, it's popping up everywhere, used as barriers to protect those from the virus. We even saw it used on the debate stage. But how effective is it? Our Whit Johnson examines what's safest with this report. From restaurants to buses, checkout counters, even presidential and politics, plexiglass dividers are now everywhere. But exactly how well do these dividers help curb the transmission of COVID-19? They do compartmentalize the air, which I think is a good safety precaution. It reduces their risk probably to some degree. Now, in a GMA Investigates exclusive, engineering professor Howard Stone and his team at Princeton University take us inside their lab. Using a fog machine and a green laser beam, these new demonstrations visualize where particles potentially carrying virus can go, even when plexiglass dividers are present. When you speak, you produce exhaled air, and that exhaled air will contain small droplets. And if you're infected, some of those small droplets will contain some virus. That air approaches the barrier, but it can't pass through the barrier. As it comes to the edge, it picks up other air motions, and it eventually works its way around to the other side. Watch as some of that green fog eventually makes its way up and around the divider. That type of particle flow could be seen in real life, like at a checkout counter where plexiglass dividers are in close proximity to people, which is why mask wearing is so critical, says Stone, to break up that jet stream. But what about a restaurant setting where diners aren't masked? This video shows how particles could travel when a divider is farther away. As they move, they will be mixing with the other air in the room. That's good. It dilutes what you exhaled. There are some studies that suggest that 300 to 1,000 virus particles are needed for infection. That's why we need to be really careful, because even a small amount of virus may potentially infect someone. And these exclusive new 3D animations by the University of Central Florida show how the virus could potentially spread in indoor spaces in just two minutes. Watch the red particles. If someone's infected, they would be exhaling warm air with potentially viruses in their breath. What happens with warm air? Just like with a hot air balloon, it elevates and takes the viral particles. And that interacts with the ventilation system, which can potentially drive it around the barriers into neighboring seating areas. Experts say that's why it's so critical to have a good ventilation system that replaces indoor air with fresh outdoor air often. The plexiglass dividers stop the large particles, and then the smaller ones may escape over the top or around the sides and find their way into a healthy person's nose. Our thanks to Wit for that. We'll be right back. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime, Nightline.
With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's most watched program across all of television. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. What you're seeing right now, this is part of the eye wall. This procession of migrants goes back two miles. There is going to be catastrophic damage. This fire has made a run. You can see those flames shooting up into the sky. We are on the jam-packed red carpet. To the right, guys. So this is the fourth weekend of protest. <laughs> Watch NBC News on location for Facebook Watch. Breaking news, context, analysis. With today's extraordinary news cycle. Now is the perfect time for ABC News Live. A streaming news game changer. The time is now for ABC News Live. Get it, streaming everywhere. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. And before we go tonight, our images of the day tonight is the first night of Hanukkah. All around the world, people of the Jewish faith coming together to celebrate the Festival of Lights. Those candles represent a miracle from centuries ago, a small supply of oil burning miraculously for eight nights. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Be sure to tune in to Robin Roberts' inspiring Thrivership Awards special starting at 9 Eastern. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Good night.